Wow, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? So good to uh, be with you today. Thank you so much for that uh, kind uh, welcome. Those of you that uh, weren't here last night, how many, of you, how many were here last night? Raise your hand. That's good. How many are here this morning? Just raise your hand. That's really good. And um, uh, those of you that were here last night, you heard this uh, accent thing that I've, uh, I've got greetings from, uh, from, the, uh, from Britain, from the Queen. Uh, she says, hi, you know, <laughs> come on back, you know, she says all that stuff. And uh, greetings uh, uh, from the British Church as well. I used to serve as Vice President of the Evangelical Alliance in the UK. And, and uh, we've, uh, Ken and I have had the privilege of being in many churches and many different denominations. And uh, years ago, uh, the Lord told us that we would have a ministry where we're always saying goodbye. We're always saying goodbye. Um, and that's what happens. We show up here Friday night. I speak last night, this morning, and then we're heading out. Not right now. Don't get too excited, but, uh, um, but just a joy to be with you. As we've traveled, we've enjoyed different foods. I always like to uh, taste the local cuisine. Last night, I experienced my very first coney. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah, a coney with flint sauce. A gastronomic delight. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, when we first came here, we found the food, not here, but to America, we found the food kind of confusing. We'd never had uh, Mexican food before, and I didn't even know how to order it. You know, I'd, I said, Could I, I'd like some uh, enchiladas, please. <laughs> enchiladas and some burritos, and that's burritos, and some and nachos as well. Those are nachos. And I went to one restaurant and I said, what's the special? They said, biscuits and gravy. <laughs> there is bizarre enthusiasm for biscuits and gravy <laughs> in this section. That's, that's good. You all sit together. You're like a club, right? Yeah, biscuits and gravy. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, where I come from, a biscuit is a cookie. Okay. So I, it's, to me, it's like, I said, biscuits and gravy? That's like Oreo cookies and gravy. That is sick and disgusting. <laughs> so anyway, we've, uh, we've figured it out. Pastor Rob very kindly said um, that I write books, and I, I do that so that you might read them. That's a good idea. Um, so a uh, number of mentions about the books. Uh, this is called There Are No Strong People. There Are No Strong People. The subtitle really is Only People With Strengths. And uh, last weekend, uh, Pastor Rob preached uh, the message, uh, I forgot that I was at war on David. You go, you're looking at me, some of you are like, oh, how did you know that? <laughs> I listened online, you know, and, and uh, I prepare when I go to a church, and I, I listen in, listen to a few messages, and great message about David. Uh, this is about Samson. He was a naughty boy, Samson. Um, everyone say naughty. I'm oh, sorry, you've got to do that again. Naughty. Naughty. There is healing in the house. <laughs> and uh, Samson was anointed by God. An angel announced his birth, but he messed things up. And uh, there, there were some real challenges in his life. And uh, I know we've only just met. I'm going to take a risk uh, uh, maybe offending someone here, so forgive me if this offends you, but... Uh, this, this book is pretty blunt, okay? It's Samson, and there's Delilah and other ladies. So there's, there's quite a lot of blunt talk in this book about... Thanks. Okay. Okay, thanks. So don't get offended. It's, it's, but if you are offended because I mentioned it, don't buy the book, okay? Because it's kind of... How many know that we need to talk about some of these difficult subjects more? Uh, in a wholesome way. So anyway, that's there. And then this book's called Staying in the Boat. Uh, if you want to walk on water, consider staying in the boat. You say, what? John Ordberg wrote a great book uh, years ago called if you, uh, about getting out of the boat. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. Uh, you preached a message, I think, a couple of years ago about that. See, I've done my homework. Um, 
Um, but, and that's absolutely true, and of course, that's the emphasis of the biblical story. But Peter did get out of the boat, but the other disciples didn't. There are times when you have to know what you can do and what you can't do, right? And knowing our limits as well as our spheres of opportunity is important. These are things I wish I'd known when I first became a Christian back in 1832. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in here. I, I, uh, I wish I'd known that saying sorry can mean nothing. Um, I wish I'd known that God isn't endlessly chatty. Um, I wish I'd known that doubters can be hero just by showing up. Uh, I wish I'd... What else did I say here? I wish I'd known that teaching isn't deep just because it's confusing. <laughs> anyway, stuff I wish I'd known. This message I'm going to preach this morning is my life message from John 21. And this book, Faith in the Fog, is an extrapolation of that. If you enjoy this message this morning, which I hope you will, please dig deeper into the story in Faith in the Fog, some daily readings throughout the year, a bunch of other stuff. And I get author's discounts, so that, mean that, that means that you do as well. So if you buy any three books, uh, it's like an up to $60 value. It's $35. You get this book, Will Your Prodigal Come Home? We can take cash and checks and, and credit cards and anything. So those are available. Before I, before I open Scripture and read it to you, just turn to two or three people around you. And I want you to ask them this really personal spiritual question. Are you ready? I want you to turn to people and just say, do you like biscuits and gravy? <laughs> Go ahead. Just, just say that. Just say that. All right. This morning, the, uh, we, this has been an encounter weekend, and uh, this morning I'm going to talk about a breakfast encounter, a breakfast encounter. I'm going to read from John chapter 21, John chapter 21, and uh, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, last night I'd read from the NIV. Whatever translation you've got, just follow along with the reading. And if you have got the amplified version, uh, you can finish the reading after lunch. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be good. Can I just say, would you pray for me? Because I feel so relaxed here. Uh, we haven't met before, and that's, that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> it's just dangerous. So uh, I'd appreciate your prayer for support. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas named the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing, we'll come too, they all said. So they went out into the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? I'm sorry, I've got to stop right there. Fellows? <laughs> what? <laughs> that sounds like a British chap, doesn't it? <laughs> Fellows? Hello? Lovely. Uh, I'm not being reverent at all here. I just need to stop because I love this, but that's a really poor translation. It's the word pedian, uh, from which we get the word pediatrician. It's like children or boys or lads. This is, it's not fellows. This is Jesus standing on the beach going, hey, boys, boys, haven't got any fish, huh? That's, that's a better translation. Right, let's carry on. <laughs> no, they replied. Then he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because of the, there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, I've got to stop again. Who's the disciple whom Jesus loved? John? Who wrote this? Okay, right. Moving on. 
It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for his strip for work, jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they're only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard, dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, do you know that I love you? Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old... You'll stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you follow me. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm delighted to be here. Frankly, I'm delighted to be anywhere um, because I am one of those sad men who gets lost everywhere he goes. Uh, We're out driving, Kay and I. We've been married for quite a long time now. We have a good marriage, uh, but we occasionally experience navigational tension. (laughs) Anybody ever experienced that? I'd invite you to come forward for ministry, but you'd probably get lost on the way, wouldn't you? And I, 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 we get lost all the time, and uh, ladies, I hope you're encouraged by this. I am one of those men who is willing to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> Excited ladies about directions over here, biscuits and gravy over there. Uh, I do stop and ask for directions. Some of you are encouraged by that. I'm glad. But sadly, the news is that while the person is giving me the directions, I get really bored with listening. (laughs) They're saying, turn left, second, right, third. And I think, oh, do be quiet. (laughs) This is numbing. I'd rather be lost right now. (laughs) I'm constantly lost. I got lost once, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in a church bathroom. That's a gift. I was speaking at this leadership conference in Canada. There were about a thousand people there, and I decided just to slip out and go to the bathroom. By the way, Christian leaders do need to use the bathroom. Can I just make that clear? I went to one church. I was in the bathroom. Guy came in. He said, hello, Jeff. He said, rather surprised to see you in here. I thought, what do you think we do? Pray about it? This is really weird. Anyway, I'm in this this, uh, bathroom, and I'm speaking at this conference on the purposes of God around the earth, a thousand leaders there. I'm in the bathroom. They've got speakers, loudspeakers in the bathroom, so you can listen to the service while using the facilities. Very helpful Christian multitasking. So I'm washing my hands, always a good idea, when I suddenly hear an announcement, and it says, uh, Jeff Lucas is coming to speak now. And I thought, he's not. He's in the bathroom. So I thought, better get out of here. So I went to push the door to get out, and the door would not open. And I put my shoulder to the door. It would not open. I kicked the door. It would not open. It was a charismatic Pentecostal conference. So I rebuked the door, and it wouldn't open. And I realized that I got turned around in the bathroom, and I was trying to break into the supplies cupboard. Five minutes later, I ran up onto the platform to speak on the subject, what God is doing around the earth. I thought, how do I know? I can't even get out of the bathroom. This is really weird. 
I spend a lot of my time bewildered, confused, and feeling a bit lost. I would like to suggest to us that that is precisely the feeling that the disciples had that morning when Jesus appeared on the beach. You see, the resurrection had happened, and I think we can get the impression that they'd heard and knew that he was alive, they had met him, that suddenly that fixed everything. And they just said, great, hooray, hallelujah, hand me a tambourine, let's just go change the world. The reality is that the resurrection was an emotional and theological tsunami that threatened to sweep them away. And when you read some of the New Testament descriptors of the disciples after the resurrection, you realize that there was still a lot of confusion and bewilderment lingering. Let me quote some of those New Testament statements. It says of them, post-resurrection, They were startled, they were frightened, they thought they'd seen a ghost. They were troubled and doubting, they needed to have their minds open to understand. They were afraid, yet filled with joy. They worshipped, but some doubted. They were trembling, bewildered, and afraid. They did not believe, they stubbornly refused to believe. They gathered fearfully behind locked doors. They They were overjoyed. You see, the resurrection didn't sort everything out. And Peter was there. I wonder how he felt, because he had messed up, we know about that, denying Jesus. He had had a private meeting with Jesus. All we know about it is that it happened on Easter Day. Nothing else is known. There had been the resurrection appearances, one uh, which was just so sudden and startling. Uh, And then there's been a week with, with nothing. If I get my resurrection chronology correct, five to seven days where nothing. And I'm thinking, they're thinking, where's he gone? What now? And they've been told to go back to Galilee. And I think, brothers and sisters, I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that they didn't expect to meet him in the early hours of that morning. First of all, It's an unusual place. They're back in Galilee, 68 miles from Jerusalem. You say, why is it unusual? He spent most of his time there. Yes, he did. But now, theologically, they were awakened to the reality that he is Messiah. Messiah would focus his attention on Jerusalem, overthrowing the hated Romans. He wouldn't mess around in Galilee anymore. Probably they were thinking, even though they've been told to go back to Galilee, where's he gone? It's an unusual time as well. In those days in Galilee, you'd go fishing at night, and then you'd sell your catch in the morning. It's, it's a time of darkness. Did you know that in John's gospel, John uses darkness and light like an artist with a color palette, not only telling us the chronology of the event, but also the mood of the event. Nicodemus comes by night. Judas goes out by night. Jesus appears in the very early hours on resurrection morning. And then Jesus shows up, and it's all so ordinary. He's standing on the beach, and they don't figure out that it's him. If I had been commissioned with the uh, choreography of the resurrection, they'd have known it was him. They'd have known, because I'd have had 64,000 angels with yellow fluorescent Doc Martins tap dancing on the beach. I would have, I'd have had the New York Symphony and a massive choir singing the Hallelujah Chorus prophetically, because it hadn't been written at that point. I'd have had navy jets swooping overhead with red, yellow, and blue smoke with, he is risen, so there. (laughs) Uh, You'd have known it was Jesus. But it's also ordinary. He's cooking breakfast. You can imagine a couple of angels leaning over the parapet of heaven, British angels. (laughs) And they say... What doth our Lord doeth now, (laughs) fellows? Sorry, I couldn't resist. And they say, 
he cooketh breakfast. And I'm not being irreverent to this text. I'm trying to interrogate it with you. He must have gone fishing or shopping that morning because he's already got fish. And if you want to believe that he just stood on the shore and said, Tilapia, come forth. <laughs> the beauty of the story, it is so ordinary, but Jesus surprises them by showing up. When I was 17, Jesus surprised me. I had no Christian background. I wasn't interested in Christianity. I thought all Christians were crazy. I go to Christ, the Christian club at, at school just to steal the cookies. I got kicked out of Sunday school after going three times for stealing the attendance stars. A teacher at my high school, a pastor's wife, demonstrated the Christian gospel to me in love and, and word. One night I got healed. It's not dramatic. Can't write a book about it. It was foot warts, foot warts, warts, warts. Some of you are going, foot what? Foot warts. <laughs> I have difficulty with certain words like party. Whenever I say party, it sounds like potty. But they go, wow. I'd never heard of healing, but I had a bunch of foot warts on my foot. <laughs> a bunch of them. And I was it's so bad, I was about to go in as a, a day patient in, in the hospital, have them removed. And I didn't, wanna, I didn't want that procedure. I'm allergic to pain. So one night, I, I, I'm not a Christian. I just, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know the gospel. I basically prayed a prayer, which was like, to whom it may concern. Jesus, God, Lord, if you're there, would you do something about my foot? The angel Gabriel did not stand at my bedside and say, Lo, I have taken away thine foot warts. <laughs> but I woke up the next morning and they're all gone. I don't know. Freak me out. I mean, it's not exciting. Come on, be honest, you clap. But it's not exciting, really. I mean, it's foot warts. I'm never going to write a book about that. Victory over foot warts. There's a bestseller, baby. I called my teacher. I said, someone stole my foot warts. She said, come to church. I went to church that night. It's a baptismal service. I'd never, I'd never seen a baptismal service. Imagine what it feels like. I'm going in. I've had this healing thing. I didn't even know that happened. I, I took a friend with me for security. And, and uh, people are worshiping like you were worshiping this morning. They got their hands in the air. I think, what do they got their hands in the air? For? What? Are they asking to use the bathroom? What's going on? And then the baptismal service took place. Freaked me out. It's like an aquatic mugging. pastor went down into the tank, grabbed these people by the throat, and shoved them under the water. They grinned before they went under. They grinned while they were under. They grinned when they came up. I thought, they've been sniffing something. This is really weird. And I went outside. I, I said to my friend, let's get out of here. We're going to get wet if we stay here. And we went outside, and I sat in my car, and I lit a cigarette, and I said, that's bleeping, well, I'm never bleeping going to another bleeping church for the rest of my bleeping life, because they're all bleeping mad. Just to be clear, I didn't say bleeping. <laughs> I vowed I'd never go to church again. Then I realized I'd left my coat in the church. <laughs> There's only, the only reason I'm here, Pastor Rob, is because I forgot my coat. I said to my friend, I've got to go back in and get my coat. Come, just cover me. So I go back in, and the youth pastor sees me. And he grinned this big grin. I've never seen so many teeth in a human head in my life. This guy was like Jaws with a Bible. It was unbelievable. I could hear that music. Turn him. He said, hello. He said, you're back. I said, yeah, I just came for my coat. Just need to grab my coat and get out. And he said, he said you want to come to the afterglow? The afterglow. 
I thought, the, what is the afterglow? Are they setting fire to the elderly? What is going on? And we went back in there singing songs and having cups of tea, because we're British. Hot tea, not iced tea, that's demonic. Hot tea. <laughs> and then one of these waterproof grinaholic baptismal candidates who had survived the encounter came dashing across the building and he said, Hello, are you a Christian? And I said, of course I am. I'm British. <laughs> Stupid statement. And I suddenly realized I wasn't. And I said, actually, I'm not. And I want to be a Christian. And my friend piped up. He said, I do too. Imagine the joy in this man's life. He's just been baptized. Now he's got two on the hook. I said, what have, I got, what have we got to do? He said, you have to come to the little room at the back. I thought, oh, this is weird. I went to the little room at the back, and I heard the news that Pastor Rob and others have shared this morning, the good news that Jesus wants to rescue us, the, the news of the cross, the news of the resurrection. And I knelt down on the floor, surprised by Jesus, and I invited him to come into my life. Just a little postscript, word got round among the afterglow that two young lads were becoming Christians. My wife Kay was there that night, visiting from another church. I opened the door of the little room at the back, expecting to find an empty building, and a great cheer went up. And they formed a line that went all the way to the back of the building to welcome us. And we had to go down that line getting handshakes and hugs, and I felt like Prince Charles without the ears. It was remarkable. <laughs> Did I say that? Did I, did I just say that? If you're listening to this podcast from Trinity Church in Flint, Michigan, and you just heard that rather offensive comment about the British Rob family, I, Pastor Rob, apologize. <laughs> that night when I met Jesus, I met Kay. That was a good night. Yeah, except she thought my friend was cute. But I'm over that. I was surprised by Jesus. And I haven't got time to share it. Although Pastor Rob said to me, he said, don't worry about the time. Well, that was enthusiastic. <laughs> I mean, biscuits and gravy got a better rap, you know, let's, let's, let's face it. Within a few weeks, I've been called into ministry. We church planted when I was 21. Kay was 18. She was a senior pastor's wife at 18. Got married. And it's been a crazy journey. And I always thought, having been surprised by Jesus, the disciples were, that that meant that it would always be easy. And then, and some of you are going to be surprised by this statement, about um, 25 years ago, I spent a year in clinical depression. And um, I say some of us are surprised. I think this is a church. In fact, I know, again, I've been listening to some of the message, messages. This is a church where you're willing to talk about the tough stuff. And be honest. Yeah. But back then, I was depressed. And not only did I feel bad, but I felt bad because I felt bad. And uh, I felt like I didn't measure up. And... Um, I looked around at other Christian leaders, and they all looked marvelously glow-in-the-dark, fluorescent and bionic. And then there was me. I, I want you to know that this morning, I, I didn't wake up this morning, do a triple backflip out of bed, catching my tambourine as I flew through the air. I landed in my cowboy boots, and the angel Gabriel handed me a cup of tea. And I felt ordinary. And I'd get those Christmas newsletters from other Christian leaders and Christians. I love Christmas. I love 
Bronner's. <laughs> I've never been there, but I love it in anticipation. But I'd get those Christmas newsletters and I'd feel even more miserable. Praise the Lord, they would say. We've had a marvelous year. Uh, little Jimmy, age three, three, is now fluent in Hebrew and Greek and plays 37 musical instruments. And some of my friends tried to help me. They, they say, we, we, we hear you're depressed. What can we do to sort you out? We hear you haven't, you haven't got the victory. I said, apparently not. And they said, what can we do to sort you out? Because often Christians are on a crusade to sort people out all the time. And I felt like saying, uh, how about going away forever? <laughs> That'd be good. Or they'd say, um, why don't you snap out of it? Some of you have heard this. Why don't you just snap out of it? And I'd say, oh, thank you. Thank you for that wisdom. If I'd have just known that I could just snap out of it, I'd have done that a long time ago. Bless you. You know, we do that little punchy thing with a little clicking noise. Now, these guys are confused. The Apostle Paul... I believe, battled depression. You say, what? Gave us a third of the New Testament. Impossible. Well, part of his writings, go, it goes like this. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Imagine that in a prayer letter from an evangelist. Greetings, prayer partners. We've been feeling suicidal lately. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I believe that Jesus battled something like depression in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, my soul is overwhelmed. And the word there, the Greek word is barrio, from which we get the word barometer. It means to be pressed down or be depressed. You say, surely that couldn't happen to Jesus. Let me tell you this, depression and sadness is not sin. It is possible, listen really carefully, I am not saying that there are times when we can contribute to our sadness by behavior that ultimately can create depression, but the notion that depression is always rooted or expressed in some kind of sin is why there, I still bump into pastors and they, they say, yeah, I'm battling this, but I, I can't tell anybody about it, like they've got some kind of inexcusable disease that they are ashamed of. And I believe we're living in a day when as a church, and I talk about the church worldwide, we are having to square up again with these issues of mental health and realize that sadness and confusion can come our way. So what does Jesus do? We're not even on the first point yet. Some of you are looking really nervous about that. Fear not, little flock. Number one, when life is foggy, determine to put God first. When life is foggy, determine to put God first, because that's something about what happens here. Have you ever noticed how much talk there is about fish in this story? Peter says, I'm going fishing, and his pals say, we'll come with you. And then John tells us they don't catch anything. Then Jesus shows up and asks for a fishing update. And, um, and then gives some supernatural kind of net direction. And then a bumper catch follows, and we're even told how many fish they catch, 153. Uh, and then it's time for breakfast. Guess what's on the menu? A lot of fish in this story. And then Jesus says over the fish, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, do you love me more than what? The traditional response to that is that Jesus was saying to Peter, do you love me more than these disciples love me? And that, listen carefully, that may be the case. But there are some academics 
who are asking the question, not making the statement, asking the question, is it possible, is it possible that Jesus was saying to fisherman Peter, do you love me more than you love fish? You say, that's crazy. Well, think about it. Fishing represented Peter's everyday existence. Fishing meant security and predictability. Uh, Peter the fisherman would have no worries about the state of the church or purity of doctrine. There would be no martyrdom. Uh, fishing represents the allure of the ordinary. You get up every day. You do your job. There's nothing on TV for another couple of thousand years, so that's the end of the day, and that night you, you go fishing. It's just ordinary life. I, I want to be honest with you. Um, sometimes I could be tempted by that. <laughs> sometimes I don't want a purpose-driven life. <laughs> sometimes I don't want purpose, and I don't want driven. I just want a life. I was going to say I just want to play golf, but I'm useless at golf. I don't have a swing. It's a spasm. Do you love me more than fish? It's possible. And then we're actually told how many fish they caught. I mean, isn't that ridiculous? Jesus is there, and some sad person in his team is sitting on the beach counting fish. 48, 49, 15, 51, 52, 53. 150, write that down, 153. The commentators go ballistic on that. What does this 153 mean, they say? Some say it means it was representative of the numbers of races or tribes in the world at that time. Another one says the number of different kinds of fish in the Sea of Galilee, that they got one of every type. What? Thank you, ma'am. That would be a grilling nightmare, wouldn't it? Another, one, another commentator, rather incredibly, says a triangular number that would have impressed ancient Pythagorean philosophers. As if Jesus said, I know what I'll do, I'll give them 153 fish, because this will impress ancient Pythagorean philosophers. I believe that right here at Trinity Assembly, after thousands of years in speculation, I can reveal unto you the reason why it is recorded that 153 fish were caught. So brace yourselves for the revelation and hold on to something solid. The reason why 153 fish were recorded as being caught is because... because that's how many they caught. <laughs> Who are you, prophetess of God? <laughs> but here's the point, and it's, it's possible that what's going on. You see, this was such an amazing catch that someone wrote it down. Is it possible, as Jesus says, do you love me more than these? that the statement is being made, and I am speculating, that even if you catch 153 fish in life, it will never satisfy. No matter how much you get, no matter how big the catch is, you can go to work to get the money to buy the food, to give you the strength to go to work, to get the money to buy the food, to give you the strength to go to work, and you've got 153 fish, but listen up. That will never satisfy the depths of your soul. And notice that Jesus switches the metaphor from being a fisher of men to a shepherd of sheep. There's a deliberate drawing away from the fishing imagery. When life is foggy, put Jesus first and loving him first. And by the way, when life is foggy, don't allow your feelings to be the barometer of your spirituality. It's not how you feel. 
I've enjoyed our worship here this weekend. And one of the reasons I've enjoyed it is because we've been exhorted to worship, but we've not been whipped into a frenzy of worship. You know what I'm talking about? Is everyone excited? Yes. Is everyone thrilled? Yes. Is everyone over the moon? Yes. Amen. 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 And every now and again, I want to stand up and say, well, don't mind me saying so, I'm bored senseless. But I still love Jesus. Secondly, don't allow the fog to be thickened by shame. Don't allow the fog to be thickened by shame. There's Peter and John in this story. Have you ever noticed as you study the New Testament that Peter always takes action before John, and John always understands before Peter? It's consistent if you study the narratives. So Peter and John are in the boat. Who is it that figures out that it's Jesus? Well, of course it's John. He always figures it out. And John says, it is the Lord, splash. <laughs> Where'd he go? That's the way it always works with these guys. Peter goes rushing up onto the beach. And what does he see? He sees a fire burning. A fire. Fire. <laughs> When's the last time you see a, a fire <laughs> Fire. <laughs> When's the last time? <laughs> When's the last time you see that in John's Gospel? I tell you when the last time you see it is it's as Peter is warming his hands by a fire. And the Greek word is the same, and Thankaran is exactly the same word. What is Jesus doing as Peter rushes exuberantly up the beach? And there's Jesus there with a, a fire burning. Is, is Jesus reminding Peter of his terrible failure? I suggest not. I suggest, as the invitation is given, do you love me more than these, that Peter is being invited to sit down by the fire of his own failure and there find an opportunity to express love once again. You see, shame silences our worship. Shame makes us want to back away into the shadows. But now, let's understand this. The forgiveness of God doesn't say it doesn't matter. It's not important. It's no big thing. The forgiveness of God rather says, no, sit down by the fire, which, yes, speaks of what you did, but by the fireside, receive the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. That's what the forgiveness of God does. And Peter is invited to express love once again. You know, I... Some people are kind of against guilt. I don't know why. It's good to feel guilty when you are. And the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit convicts us, and without guilt, we become sociopaths. Right? But too many Christians live burdened by shame. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt targets what we've done. Shame smothers us. Smothers us. Guilt says you did this wrong. Shame says you're trash. And I got really caught up on this when I, as a new Christian. I felt ashamed a lot. And someone said to me, you know, the Bible says always let your conscience be your guide. And I felt bad, so I thought, well, I must be bad. And I, I, I searched for that Bible verse, always let your conscience be your guide. I couldn't find it. It's not in the Gospels. It's not in Proverbs. It's, it's not in Paul's writings. It's... It's uh, Jiminy Cricket to Pinocchio. <laughs> you see, your conscience is a helpful gift, but it's not an infallible gift. And some of us have been raised in the art of feeling ashamed. And Peter is invited before Pentecost ever happens to leave his shame at the fireside. What about doing that today? In Colorado, we don't have trash collection. Once a week, Kay says to me, it's time. I get excited. I load up the trash sacks. 
when I go to the garbage dump, one of my favorite places. There are pools there, pools not to swim in, stinking mud and trash and birds everywhere. But I love it. I love that feeling of pulling my truck up to the dumpster and I get out and I feel a rising sense of exhilaration and I grab the stinky trash bags and we have a little moment of farewell and then I open the dumpster and I throw the trash in and I drive away going, woohoo! I dumped my trash! I want to say this thoughtfully. Bring your trash to Jesus. You say, where's the garbage dump where there is a green hill far away outside a city wall? Don't live ashamed. Thirdly, thirdly, mind your own business. You see, Peter's been given, imagine this, Peter's been given a prophetic word by Jesus about his death. This is a Pentecostal church. You believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Me too. That's why I'm in ministry, because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I, like, I love to hear the, the prophetic. And I also quite like to hear prophecy, uh, you know, like when someone gives me a, a, a word personally. I like it when I can understand what they're talking about. You ever had those prophetic words given to you? That, and it's weird. People says, I, say, I, I, I've got a picture of a yellow jellyfish who is tap dancing on a tin of chili beans. Whistling, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. And then they look you and they look at you and they go, Does that mean anything to you? And you think, yes. Get help. Imagine being told by Jesus. I mean, I've got I've got a prophetic word for you, Peter. If I if I'm there, I'd think, I hope it's a good one. You know, like blessing, anointing, a new car, something like that. Let me tell you something, Peter. Let me tell you, you're going to die a martyr's death. I think I'd say, I think that's the flesh. And if it isn't, I don't want it anyway. But Peter knew this was Jesus. I cannot imagine, quite seriously, what he must have felt like. And then he does what we would perhaps be tempted to do. He says, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I love that about John. He never mentions his own name. He just says he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Maybe the only thing he wanted us to know about him was that he was, the, he was loved by Jesus. And Peter's been given this prophetic word, so he, he, he says to Jesus, what about him? I mean, you would, wouldn't you? Have you got a cracker for him? And and Jesus could have said this. He could have said, yes, yes, he will be exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and they will try and boil him alive, but he will survive. But Jesus says none of that. He says, what's that to you? In other words, mind your own business. Do you know what often we do, folks? We get preoccupied with what isn't essentially important. And we think that God is also preoccupied with those things. And sometimes we just need to hear Jesus say, don't worry about that. Just get on with the business of following me. It happens in church life. I've been a pastor for a lot of years now. People get get fixated on little things. Someone's sitting in my pew. The pew that Jesus gave me. The service was too long. The service was too short. It's too hot in here. It's too cold in here. They didn't sing my song this morning. They didn't use the version of the Bible that I like. Someone is in the parking space that Jesus gave unto me. We can be preoccupied with incidental... So are, we, are we okay for a few more minutes? Are you, are you okay? I mean, we're, we're heading out this afternoon. I might never see you again, so let me... Are we okay? And if you need to leave, 
we won't embarrass you. We'll applaud. No, we won't. We won't. That would, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. We get preoccupied with things that don't matter in church. I, I went to a church where they decided to change the bins, the waste paper bins, in the bathrooms. Uh, there's a small bin that had been in the, the ladies' bathroom for many years. It faithfully served the sisters. And they decided to change it to a larger bin. Thank the Lord, the church was growing. A larger bin was required. <laughs> but the board, the deacons met, and they said, we don't want to change this too quickly because we don't want the ladies to experience bin trauma. <laughs> I'm so serious. So they said, we'll put the new bin next to the smaller bin. And then after a few months, when they got used to the new bin, we'll remove the smaller bin. I'm like, what? Serious? I'm not making this up. Anyway, I told that story at a conference, and afterwards this guy came down the aisle, and he looked angry. It happens to me. And he, I, he said, I'm upset with you. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm from the church with the bin. And I'm like, oh, beam me up, Jesus, you know. <laughs> so he said, you laughed at our church. He said, he said, you thought it was so cute, didn't you? He said, what you don't know is that that small bin was given by my family when my grandfather died. We gave that bin in memory of him. And I, now I'm traumatized. But in my head, I'm thinking, what kind of sicko family gives a bathroom bin? <laughs> what? Oh, granddad's dead. Let's buy a bin for the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, we could have the Jeffrey Lucas Memorial Toilet Brush, couldn't we? Yes, every time we use it, we think of his hairstyle, yeah. Anyway, I'm apologizing, he's upset, and, and then after about 10 minutes of agony, he looked at me and he went, I'm joking! <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're... <laughs> but listen up, listen up. Lean forward slightly, this is between me, lean forward, lean forward. Lean forward. Some of you are going, don't you British people come over here and tell us to lean forward? We beat you. Remember July 4th? I know, I know, I know. Just lean forward slightly. Sometimes we're not joking. We get upset over stupid stuff. Some of you are going to say, to Pastor Rob this week. He made me lean forward. <laughs> lean back, relax. <laughs> Don't sweat the small stuff. Okay, listen, you've been listening to me for a long time. There's one last thing I need to say. And then we're gonna we're gonna pray. And the last thing is this. Number four, if you're writing anything down. And that is, offer Jesus the life you have now. Offer Jesus the life you have now. There's, there's something really important in this story because the whole John 21 episode, brothers and sisters, is a rebuilding of the scenery of Luke chapter 5 where Peter was called by Jesus three years earlier. It's as if Jesus is reconstructing the scenery of Peter's calling. Miraculous catch of fish again. But now he's inviting him to embrace the present and navigate a perilous future which involved martyrdom. And notice this, around these parts, Peter had walked on water, but now he has to walk through water to get to Jesus. Anyone ever tried to walk on water? 
Anyone ever tried? Raise your hand if you've ever tried it. There's a few people over there in biscuits and gravy. <laughs> over here. Um, I tried it. I tried it. I thought walking on water, that would be really cool. We were staying at a hotel. The swimming pool was deserted, so I went down there. And I thought, I'm going to try it. I'm serious, I did. And uh, I put my swimsuit on. Faith without works is dead. But... Uh, <laughs> And I stepped out onto the water, and um, I sank. But I tell you what, it looks like a lot of fun. Given the preference, walking on water or walking through it, I know what I would choose. I, I want to be striding across the waves. And listen up as the worship team come, please, if you would. Some of us have known seasons in our lives when we have, figuratively speaking, walked on water. And it felt amazing. Prayers were being answered. We felt like we were under an open heaven. But now you find yourself in a situation where you're not walking on water, but you're wading through the current. And it threatens to sweep you away. And you long for the glory days when it was different. The question is not walking on it or through it. The question is, in this current season of my life and yours, will we still hear his call, follow me? Lovely young people sitting over there together. You follow him in this season, but then follow him all the way through. Great to see you here. Older folks here and everything in between. I shared with you, and musicians, just feel free to just quietly play if you would. Thank you. I started off the message hadn't planned with sharing any of my testimony with you. And Kay nudged me during the worship and she said, I feel like you should tell people how you came to Jesus today. That's why this message is longer than I planned because someone probably just needed to hear about that journey. But that morning over breakfast, Peter once again offered the life that he had then. He had to learn to mind his own business. He left his shame at the fireside and once again he expressed his love for Jesus. The question lingers. And the question he asks of me and of you, young and old, everything in between. It's two words. Older folks, with what you know now, you've been around the block, you've had some disappointments, you've seen Christians and church at its best and its worst. And the question is this, follow me? Still up for this? Follow me? If you're able, stand quietly together.